Today we are continuing with working our way through the gospel according to Luke. And we are coming to the close of Luke chapter 1 today, the grand conclusion. We, we also touched upon this last Sunday, and we continue today. If you missed last Sunday's sermon, be sure to listen to it later. It supplements and connects with the one today. Uh, we're going to be beginning with Malachi, Malachi chapter 4, verses 2 and 5. And then we'll move on to Luke chapter 1 and, and close our scripture readings today with the book of Revelation, the final chapter of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, a couple of verses there. Hear now God's word. But for you who fear my name, says the Lord, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out like leaping uh, leaping like calves, newborn calves from the stall. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord's coming. And then to Luke chapter 1. We're going to be reading from verse 59 through verse 79, picking up at the story we looked at last week, picking up at the, the day of the circumcision, eight days from the baby's birth. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were calling him Zechariah after his father, but his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. He said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. And so they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. John is his name. And they all marveled. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came upon all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him in his presence all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And then finally, to the closing chapter of the book of the Revelation of Jesus to John the Apostle, verses 16 and 17. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root, the source, the root source, and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. 
The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who desires take the water of life without price. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Eyes on the sunrise. That's the title of our sermon today. Can you say that with me? Eyes on the sunrise. Um, Eyes on the sunrise. Believe before dawn. Part of this little sub-series we're doing with Luke, Believe Before Dawn. And of course, as you can hear from the sermon title today, we are directly on point with this. Uh, Eyes on the sunrise. Uh, Let me just say something about sunrise, and we'll close out with this too. If I'm sleeping during the sunrise, will I see it? No. What if I'm awake but I've turned on all my artificial lights inside and refused to go out and look at the horizon. Will I see the sunrise? No. What if I'm pretty obsessed with artificial light and not just lights that I turn on overhead, but like little glowing rectangles that uh, Apple or Samsung or somebody else sells to me and all the little popping information with glows that I can get. Or let's say I'm a little old-fashioned and I watch stuff like cable news all the time. If I'm, if I'm sitting there staring at all that ambient artificial light, am I going to see the sunrise? What do you think? No, it matters toward where I turn my eyes. If I'm going to be obsessed with myself and with human-generated advertising and clickbait and everything else, I'm probably going to miss the sunrise. Keep that in mind as we remember the central call of our sermon today, eyes on the sunrise. Is that eyes on my iPhone? No, that's eyes on the sunrise. Now, the, the echoing question that we have, we had it last week, we have it again today from Luke chapter 1 in this segment dealing with the birth of John the Baptist is that question, that question of marvel and concern and wonder that the people are asking, what then will this child be? Now, do you hear that? That is a future tense question. And it's a future looking kind of question. What does the future hold? What does the future hold? We think about that when children are born a lot, right? even the grumpiest old people like me, you know, if a child is born, all of a sudden we get our eyes off of our own navel and maybe off of cable news for a minute or off of our iPhone or Samsung smartphone and we actually look up and think about the future and what's ahead, right? What will this child be? You think about that when children or grandchildren are born in your family, right? You start thinking about the future. If you're a parent, I hope you're a little bit paying attention to the future, thinking about the future and asking, what will this child be? What will they be? What will new officers be? Today we are going to, as we move toward the conclusion of this service, install new officers for a class of 2025. That's a little bit presumptuous of us. Who knows if the world's still gonna be around in 2025, but hey, we're gonna go ahead and put them in the class of 2025. New officers, we're right here in a new year of ministry. Next Sunday, we'll meet for our annual meeting of the congregation and the corporation and talk about ministry plans. What happened in 2022, but also look ahead in 2023. And all of this, of course, reminds you that God is calling you to be asking those questions. What am I supposed to be in the day, in the year ahead? What is God calling me to be? And, and what does the future hold? Who holds the future for me, for you, for us together? Well, let's, uh, let's remember where we are in this series and learning from Luke. Look back to look ahead. That was the, after a couple of introductory sermons that we did for Luke, and the overarching structure and the theological message of Luke, when we opened this year on January 1st, you'll remember the first sermon as we really began to move forward in the book. Um, look back. 
to look ahead. Look back to look ahead. It's January 1st, and it pretty much speaks to every day we live. According to Luke's gospel, according to the New Testament, according to the whole Bible, in order to look ahead, we also do need to be aware of what has come before. We need to look back in order to look ahead, not just on January 1st, but every day we live. So let's remember this. I've pretty much already given you the answer, hinted pretty strongly, and you've, you've been told this for about five Sundays now. <laughs> what does the name Zechariah mean in Hebrew? Yah is short for Yahweh, that's the Lord, okay? So what does it mean? Zechariah, come on folks. The Lord does something, what does he do? The Lord remembers. The Lord remembers. Remember, I've already kind of covered this in two or three sermons. Does that mean that the Lord God is senile? Kind of, he needs to be, you know, he needs to pull up some memory bank on this. No, 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 no. This is covenant language. Like when the, uh, the Hebrew people cry out from Egypt and the Lord remembers his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and says, I'm going to save those poor, those poor folks, you know. The Lord remembers. When we come to a table that is a table of Jesus Christ, what are we called to do? We are called to remember. It's covenant language, okay? So the Lord remembers, which reminds us that God is what kind of Lord? He's the covenant Lord, the covenant Lord who remembers his covenant. Now, there are a lot of people who make you promises that seem to forget them. Children will remind parents. If, if parents make a promise that they don't come through with, will your children remember? Children have really good memories. Uh, do spouses have good memories sometimes? Yeah. Well, here, hey, here's the thing. A lot of times we don't come through with our promises. Uh, politicians, the ones we elect and send to Washington, D.C., do they come through with all their promises? No, they kind of seem to forget some. The Lord, though, remembers. Isn't that awesome? He's a truly covenant God. Um, so God is the covenant Lord, which means he gives promises, and he does what with the promises? Moves on from them? No, he fulfills, he fulfills his promises. So go back to the December 18th sermon on Luke, which pretty much introduced the theological sweep of Luke and the fact that Luke is writing to Theophilus saying, I'm writing this so you'll know what has been fulfilled among us. The promises, you know, sweeping all the way through the scripture. Fulfilled among us. Fulfilled. He gives promises, he fulfills them. Let's go through what we looked at last week, just briefly remind you of the sequence. It is a, certainly a sermon unto itself, but just kind of five moves here that we covered with the story of uh, Zechariah's son, John, being born. Number one, Zechariah. In obedient faith writes, John is his name. Now, all the culture and all the friends and family, all those helpful friends and neighbors and everybody, <laughs> they are all trying to get Elizabeth and Zechariah to go along with the typical traditional customs and the way we do church around here and the religion and say, no, 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 his, his name's got to be Zechariah Jr. Come on, you're an old man anyway. You've got get, to gotta get somebody named after yourself before you go on to your eternal reward. But Zechariah, what does he do? He remembers the Lord, just like the Lord remembers him. And Zechariah and Elizabeth are having none of it. They say, no, no, no. His name is not just the Lord remembers. His name is the Lord is gracious or the Lord's gracious gift. Yohanan. His name is John. The Lord is gracious. So they don't forfeit the gift of God's grace. That's what we're being told. We talked about that last week, right? So, in obedient faith, he writes, John is his name. His speech, Zechariah's speech, is restored. It's set free. His mouth is open, right? His tongue is loosed. And flowing from the... You know, that, that's, by the way, something for our officers and for all of us to understand. When we trust in God and obey God, God gives us the opportunity to speak his word profoundly to others. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. So... Um, Flowing out of that, 
Um, Zechariah, what are the first words out of his mouth? Does he talk about himself and what he's been experiencing for the last nine months? No. Does he talk about the baby? Parents, parents of newborns, pay attention to this. Expecting parents, pay attention to this. Is his main focus on his own baby? No, of course he's gonna to turn to his own baby, but the main focus, believe it or not, there's somebody else more important in the room than the baby. And who is that? God. So his first words, this is awesome, Zechariah's first words when his baby, you know, that he can speak about, his newborn baby, is he blesses God. Blesses God. Before even speaking about baby John. Then, number four, because of this and flowing from this, he is filled with the Holy Spirit. So he, he's going to be in, in the mode of a prophet. He's in the calling of a prophet now. And he, number five, proclaims his psalm, the Benedictus, on which we're primarily focusing today, the Benedictus. Now, Benedictus is kind of like I told you about the Magnificat. You're talking about the Incipit, the Incipit line in the Latin, the, from the Latin Vulgate. Uh, Benedictus Dominus Deus, Israel. That, that's the Latin first line of the classic church traditional Latin interpretation from this scripture. So that's why we call it the Benedictus. Um, it is a praise and prophecy psalm in two parts. But let me tell you this, as, as we get into what this is, you need to understand this. This is like I told you about with Mary's Magnificat. This is prophecy that is totally saturated in and linked to Old Testament scripture, Hebrew scripture, that Mary knew from singing in her case and from going to, the, you know, to worship and to Shabbat and to special festivals like Hannah's song. Zechariah, think about Zechariah. This is a priest. This is a man who has access to scrolls and has probably memorized most of the Old Testament himself. He's silent for nine months. Do you think he's not only talk, thinking about what Gabriel has told him about his son in the bigger picture, but also meditating on scripture for nine months if he can't talk? What do you think? So this prophecy, this psalm, this is a psalm, okay, that Zechariah is gonna give us, it is saturated in Hebrew scripture, in Old Testament scripture. And the first line totally is a quotation from the close of book one of the Psalms, from the close of book two of the Psalms, and from the close of book four of the Psalms. We actually opened with today with the call to worship was the close of book two of the Psalms. Okay? This is the way this, this is blessing language. But let me make this clear. This is not, if you've been to Jewish worship services or maybe um, you know, like a Passover Seder or something like that. This is not Baruch Atah uh, language. It's not like Baruch Atah Adonai Elohenu Hamelech Alam. It's not, it's not talking to God. It's blessing about God. So this is different. This kind of language, which you'll see at the close of book two, book one, book four of the Psalms, and elsewhere in uh, David, this is Baruch Yahweh Israel. Baruch Yahweh Elohim Elohei Israel. This is blessed be the God of Israel, okay? The Lord God of Israel. So he's prophesying to people with good news about God, blessing God in the process, but he's not directly saying to you, to God, okay? So this is about a message to the people and to you and me about the blessing of God. And this prophecy psalm is in two parts. Number one, the accomplished past. And yeah, you can see I've got past in quotation marks because this is the language that he's using. So in the, in the, um, this, this is all in Greek. Luke is in Greek. So uh, the, the word for blessing, by the way, is elegetos. Uh, so that's like a eulogy, okay? Um, it's in the past because like, like in the Old Testament, there's something that's called the Hebrew perfect um, that's prophetic where something that is just beginning to happen is treated as a done deal. Okay, you ever been in a situation where, man, once you get, 
once the bulldogs step on the, to the court, the game is won, you know, that kind of situation. <laughs> so that's what's going on here. That's the way he's talking about something that's just begun, but he's treating it as a done deal. It's happened. Prophetic past. In, in the Greek, this is in what's called the aorist. So anyway, this is accomplished past, even though it just began. Okay? Interesting, right? And then the second little part of the psalm is on our assured future. So accomplished past, assured future. It's also structured. I'll pull out of this in a minute, but I just want you to understand this. And this is important. It's structured as what's called a chiasm. And I'm not going to go into the whole chiasm with you, but I want you to get the framing verbs because you're supposed to pay attention to these. The framing verb is visit. Visit. It opens and closes the action here. What does visit mean? It means to come. It's about the Lord's coming. When the, this is blessing God because he has visited his people. And then it closes out with the visit theme at the end of the psalm. Now, let me explain something to you. In the Bible, the Lord comes when he's going to act in two ways. The Lord can come in judgment and condemnation. Is that good news? Well, probably not for the people he's coming to judge and condemn, right? But he can also come in grace and redemption. And what Zechariah is saying is, hey, folks, I got good news. <laughs> After a lot of bad times, the Lord has come, and he is coming to redeem. Do you see that second verb there? He is coming to redeem. He's coming in grace. So that's the message. That puts our focus on what the Lord is up to in his coming. Now, let's go into part one of this psalm. Um, Look back and see and bless God for what God is doing right now and has already pretty much made sure is going to happen. Why do we bless him? As I already said, because he has visited and redeemed. He's come to redeem us, not to strike us with, you know, lightning and, you know, banish us to hell. He's coming to redeem us. Uh, salvation has come. That's what Zechariah say, salvation's come. This is good news, incredible good news, the ultimate good news. But how specifically and why? How has he come? Why has he come? What's going on here? Um, he's raised up something. He's raised up what? Again, here we are with this question. Is this really about John? No, this is not about John. John's going to be part of the story, but the big deal is John is not the leading actor in this movie. Okay? He's raised up the Messiah. The Messiah. Uh, Zechariah says he's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. That's messianic language. Fulfilling the promises he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets. Promises to save us from our enemies. Uh, this is linking all the way back to God's incredible covenant promises to David, King David. And center point of this in the Old Testament is in 2 Samuel chapter 7. In that narrative, David has decided, I'm going to build a, he says a house, a bait. I'm going to build a house for God. He means I'm going to build a temple. And God sends word back through the prophet Nathan, no, 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 no. You're not going to build me a house, in other words, a temple building. But I am going to build for you a house. But God's not talking about a, like a house like we think about. He's talking about a dynasty. And then God says this dynasty is going to be eternal unto the eternal kingdom of God. This is incredible. So look at this. Um, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. There's that rest from the enemies language again. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. This is the house of David. This is what the Messiah story is all about. This is, so this is the ultimate son of David. Now, the Benedict is part one. So Zechariah is saying the horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. So Zechariah is saying, look at the sunrise. 
the messianic age has dawned. That's basically what he's saying there. That's big picture. The messianic age has come. But baby John is not from the house of David. Baby John is from the house of Aaron. He's from the tribe of Levi. He's not even from the tribe of Judah. I mean, a really significant house, the house of Aaron, you know, the line of the priest. But this is not the messianic house of David kid. So what's the deal? Is there somebody else in our story that to whom we've been introduced, even though he's not born yet, who may be from the house of David? Who would that be? The baby that Mary is carrying. And Zechariah is saying, it's already happened. You want to talk about looking for the sunrise. This is really looking for the sunrise. You know, Mary's a few months pregnant with the Messiah. To show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember what? What are we supposed to remember? The holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham. Now, this is awesome. Um, in the midst of the Lord speaking the second time through the angel of the Lord on Moriah, when the Lord says to Abraham, no, 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 don't sacrifice your son, your one and only son, Isaac. He says, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and will surely multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. In other words, this is the gospel for everybody. It's awesome. Uh, because you have obeyed my voice. Now look at that. By myself I have sworn. God swears unto himself. But that could potentially imply that there are two persons involved in this swearing or this oath taking. And it's not Abraham. Oh wow, we're dealing with the Godhead himself and we're dealing with the Father and the Son. Um, something else about this uh, that's, that's really important for us to notice is uh, the Holy Covenant uh, you see that covenant language there? The word there in the Greek is deatheke. It, it's only going to appear one other time in Luke. And it's way later. In Luke chapter 22, verse 20. You see that? And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, and this is Jesus talking, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant. So we got the covenant with Abraham, and now we have the new covenant. And that's toward what we're looking. Um, why has he visited and redeemed? The goal is that we might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. All our days. What are you called to do as a Christian? To glorify and enjoy God, right? How do you do that? You serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness all your days, without fear. Not a child of fear, but a child of faith. Um, what about this baby John, though? He's not the Messiah. And let me tell you this, he's also not, um, he's not God. This scripture that um, Zechariah is quoting, I, I skipped that, we were kind of moving on, but um, back to Psalm 18, and it's also in 2 Samuel 22. Uh, it's a psalm of David. It's really important because it's in two places in the Bible. You're supposed to pay attention to that. But when David is talking about the Lord God, he says, you're my rock. You're my savior. You're the horn of my salvation. So David's not the horn. No human being is the horn of salvation. God is the horn. So notice, connect this back to what Zechariah is saying. Zechariah is saying, a horn of salvation has arisen from the house of David. But he's not just a son of David, he's also God's son. Because back in Psalm 18 and 2 Samuel 22, David is talking about God as the horn of salvation. So John's definitely not the Messiah. He's definitely not, definitely not God. He's not the horn of salvation. Who is he? What's his future? Um, look ahead. Let's look ahead. John is the forerunner. He is the promised forerunner of Isaiah 40 and Malachi 4. He's going to go to prepare the way for the Lord. 
He's going to prepare the people for the Lord's visitation, for the Lord's coming. And he also heralds the salvation to God's people of the, this is the gospel, the forgiveness of sins. See, if, even if God comes in good news, you're going to have no part of it. I'm going to have no part of it unless my sin is forgiven because God cannot have fellowship with sin. In order for me, in order for you, in order for God's people to be part of the story, sin must be forgiven. So John is coming to herald the visitation of God and specifically the gospel of the forgiveness of sins. He's calling people to repentance. Now, John's not going to get the whole gospel, but he, he gets that much of it. And then also, the sunrise from on high shall visit us to give us what? John can't give this. To give us light. Uh, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. Isaiah 9 Chapter 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. What light are we talking about? If you know Isaiah 9, you could fast forward in Isaiah 9, 6. What do you say there? For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The Messiah, right? Um, Malachi 4, 2. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. This is a messianic prophecy, but even more, it's talking about God himself coming. God's visit via the horn of salvation in David's house as the son of righteousness. So let's make the connecting points here. The horn of salvation in David's house, the Messiah, is greater than just a human Messiah. He's God himself because he is the horn of salvation. And the horn of salvation is the sunrise who brings healing and restoration. Jesus, that's who that is. So here's what Jesus has to say to you. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, if you will follow me, you will not walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. And also Jesus says, I am the root, in other words, the source, I'm God, okay? I am the root and the descendant of David. I am the bright morning star. Get your eyes off of whatever you have your eyes on other than me and look to me. Look up. Get your eyes off whatever light is deceiving you, false light, and look to me. Your hope, your salvation, your God. So what will they be? What will your children be? People of the light? I pray they will. Parents, we guide our children not just into some random future, not just about making good grades here or there, scoring a point. It's about being with Jesus in the light. What will our officers be? We pray, we hope, we trust, and we surround them with God's grace as we pray for them, that they will walk in the light and have eyes for the sunrise. Our church, as we move forward in 2023, same call. Eyes on the sunrise. That's the main thing of what we're called to do. I've got four of them here for us as we close and move to the installation. Keep your eyes on the sunrise. Serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness. If you look up to the sunrise, you don't have to be afraid. And you can flourish in holiness and righteousness. Serve him. Don't sit on the sidelines. Serve him. What are you doing for the Lord right now? Honestly, let us grow in service to him. Herald the gospel of his salvation. And I have good news for you. As great a preacher as John the Baptist was, you, 
in your evangelism should be far greater. Jesus says this, I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John, yet one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. You're a Christian? You've got a bigger herald and a bigger opportunity to share the good news. And number four, pray for his coming. The New Testament keeps saying over and over again, the Lord loves those who love his appearing, his coming, his visitation. He's coming again. And he is the bright morning star. Let us look to him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.